Item 5, Old Business. Item A, Brisbane Baylands Planning Applications, Baylands Concept Plans, Brisbane Baylands Specific Plan, Case SP-01-06, General Plan Amendment, Cases GP-01-06, GP-01-10, Related Final Environmental Impact Report, and Water Supply Assessment. The subject site encompasses 733 acres generally bounded on the east by U.S. Highway 101, on the west and south by Bayshore Boulevard, and on the north by the city and county of San Francisco. Site general plan designations include Northeast Bayshore Trade Commercial, Baylands Trade Commercial Plan Development, Beatty Heavy Commercial, and Marsh Lagoon Bayfront, and it is zoned C3 Heavy Commercial, C1 Commercial Mixed Use, M1 Manufacturing, and Marsh Lagoon Bayfront, Universal Paragon Corporation applicant. Item one, discussion and deliberations on the above planning applications, the planning commission recommendations, and any variations thereof, including maintaining the current general plan policies for the Baylands related to land use, including but not limited to mixed distribution and intensity of uses and development standards, and providing direction to staff concerning scheduling a public hearing concerning the outcome of such discussions or deliberations. Deliberations may also address the possibility of putting forth a ballot measure addressing some or all of the legislative actions related to the project that are under consideration by the City Council. So before we have a staff report, I wanted to let the public know that our Sacramento lobbyists have been tracking legislation of interest to this city, including legislation relating to local land use and housing. They report that legislative negotiators have reportedly reached a tentative agreement on a package of bills impacting local government land use decisions. Our lobbyists are working to confirm the details of the proposed legislative package. Given the legislative summer recess, they anticipate that any specifics of the legislative package will not be known until the legislation is made public. They anticipate that this will occur when the legislature returns from its recess. In light of this development, I believe it would be best to wait for this new legislation to be made public and analyzed as to its relevance to the city before the council discusses or deliberates any particular land use plan. Accordingly, the discussion tonight will be limited to asking any questions or clarifications the Council may have regarding the new responses in Attachment 4 of the staff report. And we, of course, will take public comment as well. Staff report, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, given the uh, comments uh, that the Mayor has just indicated um, there won't be a staff report as we won't be uh, moving on to that item on the agenda. Um, I do want to indicate that uh, we will be working with the Sacramento lobbyist uh, uh, group um, and as soon as we have some more clarification and understanding of state legislative package we will report that back to the council. We just don't have any timing on that at this particular point in time. Um, the, the staff is available to respond to any qu uh, questions the council may have with regards to items that were answered in this week's packet that uh, are fresh from uh, from um, the questions that the council had previously asked. Thank you. And before we get to questions, um, I was informed that we have a representative here from Jerry Hill's office who has asked if um, they can give some um, brief statement before we move any further. So if that representative would like to come up at this time. Good evening, Madam, uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members. My name is Joan Dentler and I'm a field representative in State Senator Jerry Hill's office. He's asked me to be here this evening to deliver uh, a, a statement on behalf of, of our district office. and. Um, my name is Kevin Fong and I'm a field rep with Assemblymember Kevin Mullins' office and doing my duty I will defer to the upper house, that is the Senate. <laughs> so I'd like to read the statement from Senator Hill and Assemblymember Mullen, if I may. The city of Brisbane finds itself with an opportunity at a moment in history that if acted upon could revolutionize development, land use, housing, transportation, commerce, culture, the environment, and the economy on the peninsula and in the Bay Area. The Baylands project 
presents a rare and important opportunity to improve the quality of life for the residents of Brisbane and the region through sustainability plan that includes a variety of different components and housing plays a central and essential role in that plan to build a sustainable community. People are, increase, are increasingly interested in the opportunity to live, recreate, and shop where they work and vice versa, a concept that held true in the early days of most communities. Besides the added bonus of reducing traffic congestion, this concept has the potential to strengthen this community's cultural, civic, and communal properties in an environment, environmentally sensitive design. When people live where they work, they have more time to engage and contribute to their community. This moment in time provides the City of Brisbane with a unique opportunity to demonstrate to the region and to the state that it can exercise local control and also demonstrate leadership in addressing the region's housing crisis, sea level rise, and transportation needs in a way that is smart, sustainable, and timely. It is the right thing to do for this and future generations. We are proud to represent the City of Brisbane and Sacramento, and we are always available to you as a resource. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I will turn to my colleagues for any questions from the staff report. I do not. Could, could you give a, a copy of the letter to the city clerk, please? Good idea. Does anyone have any questions before we move on to public I comment? Not. I, I did have one question that I request staff to provide um, some information on the legend for attachment one, and I thought that I would have that um, on the dais tonight. I apologize for not having that for you, but um, I can provide it either this evening or prior to the subsequent meeting. Further clarification just would be uh, it would be helpful for me on this. I know it's in the document, but I think having a, a short and concise um, documentation of that would be helpful to me in the future. Right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Cliff, did you have any questions? I did not. Thank okay. you, Madam Mayor. Okay. All right. Well, I do have a stack of speaker cards, so we'll move on to that. Um, speakers have five minutes, and we'll use the light system. So it'll turn yellow when you have one minute remaining, and red when your time is up. So please be considerate. First is Matt Reagan. Madam Mayor, Council Members. Cliff, old friend, how are you? Um, I'm Matt Regan with the Bay Area Council. We represent about 300 of the largest employers in the nine-county Bay Area region, all uh, sectors of the economy from tech to biotech to education and everything in between. Um, our members' number one concern uh, that they report to us almost daily is the lack of housing in this region for their workforce. Um, they are uh, expanding out of uh, the Bay Area. They're looking at other cities to grow. Um, this is an incredibly expensive and constrained place for companies uh, to grow and for middle-income families to, to live. It's not the place it was 20 years ago. We have, uh, in the last decade, we have created one, or permitted rather, one housing unit for every eight jobs we've created. And that mismatch in the housing job supply is what's created our, our housing and aff uh, affordability crisis. Every morning, 170,000 people drive over the Altamont Pass from their affordable homes in Tracy and in Manteca and in Lathrop to their jobs right here in the Bay Area. Uh, that's not a sustainable model. It's not fair to those families. They should be able to afford to live here, uh, but they cannot. Uh, that's not the worst environmental consequence. Uh, every year, 250,000 low-income families leave California in search of affordable housing. 70,000 of those families go to one state, Texas, and as soon as they arrive, their greenhouse gas production per capita goes from three tons in California to 17 tons in Texas. So there are dire environmental consequences from our inability or refusal on willingness, whatever it happens to be, to build sufficient housing here in our uh, part of the world to, to, to support our growing population. And then there's an equity consequence as well, which binds all this together. The LEO's report uh, from two years ago shows that the bottom 25% of income earners in California are spending 67% of their disposable income, their take-home pay, on rent. 
It's, a, it's the single biggest driver of generational poverty in our state, is the inability for families to find safe, affordable places to live. This project gives the, the, this city the ability, the opportunity, to take a bite out of that problem. And we would urge that you make the long-term, responsible, sustainable decision uh, and use this site for the highest and best use, and that is a lot of homes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Barnes. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. My name is Michael Barnes. I'm a Brisbane resident. And since 2008, when I was on the City Council of Brisbane, I've been in favor of housing on the Baylands. I'm still in favor of housing on the Baylands. I still think it's a good idea. You know all the environmental reasons why it's a good idea. I think it can be built safely. But tonight, I'm, well, first I'm concerned that you're not taking a vote um, because it seems pretty clear the Council doesn't have three votes for housing on the Baylands, and I was hoping that you would take your action so that the state legislature could then take some action. Um, the city council did a survey of the citizens of Brisbane, and approximately half the people in Brisbane cons would consider some housing on the Baylands, but you have not followed up on your survey. I think it's because you don't like that answer. You also had the citizens' preferred alternative a Baylands plan developed by the people of Brisbane, which included housing on the Baylands. But the City Council stripped housing out of their proposal for the Baylands. So tonight I'm here to say that you're not listening to me and people like me. I have a lot of knowledge of the Baylands. I started the Baylands process when I was on the City Council. And I think that the fact that we have 120 legislators in Sacramento and we have 130 housing bills in Sacramento show that everybody in California thinks housing is a problem and that we should build some housing here. I'm concerned also that the city of Brisbane doesn't seem to have any allies. Recently there was a meeting um, where our two county supervisors voted to proceed with a document that said there should be housing considered on the Baylands. Uh, Canapa and Pine voted against the expressed wishes of city representatives. Um, our two state legislators have just weighed in saying there should be housing on the Baylands. If the city of Brisbane is going to persist in not permitting housing on the Baylands, I don't think you're going to be successful without allies. Historically, Brisbane has succeeded in fighting housing by having allies at the county level and at the state level. And it appears to me we don't have those allies. I'm very concerned that if the city continues in this stance, that the city could be punished in a way that would affect me. And I'm for housing. <laughs> so please consider some housing on the Baylands. Negotiate with your state legislators. I mean, we, you just had an invitation to talk to Jerry Hill. I'd say you take that opportunity and talk to him and say, what can we get if we build 1,000 units of housing? What can we get if we build 2,000 units of housing? Maybe you negotiate and say 1,000 units and then we get 20 years of exemption from the RENA process. And then we don't get penalized for building those 1,000 units when we come back into the RENA process later because the arena process also contains uh, ex expectation for future building based on how much you have built. Or if it's 2,000 units, get a 40 or 50 year exemption. Do something. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Kropka. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Paul Krupka. I'm an independent transportation consultant uh, with over 35 years of multimodal experience in the San Francisco Bay Area um, with substantial experience right here in the, in the county and Silicon Valley. I've studied many development uh, and transportation projects, um, all kinds and sizes, and have conducted numerous analyses like the ones done for for the Baylands project. Um, I'm a San Mateo County resident, long term for 30 years. I think you've got a unique project, clearly. Um, 
I think the developer's proposal is a great example of a mixed-use transit-oriented development that offers many complementary features. And these complementary features will act to reduce the overall external impacts on the transportation system. Um, uh, previous speakers spoke to that. It, the, the proposal provides many new homes which provide additional transportation benefits and help ease the housing crisis we all face. I think the investments you all have made, uh, the city, uh, the developer, uh, the community at large, in doing the planning, uh, conceptual design, evaluation, and community engagement have resulted in a world-class project that is scalable and, and um, which, which I, think, I think you're ready for decisions about magnitude and mix, um, followed by discussions uh, about implementation. This is what indeed you've been talking about. Um, I think the parties uh, need to keep the big picture in mind and consider the biggest and the best project you, you can possibly uh, create that will complement the city uh, and that will also in turn complement the county, the region, and the state. This is a world-class uh, major um, opportunity for you. Um, you and we all have to commit to the hard work required to bring the project to fruition um, the project will take many years. It's not an overnight uh, opportunity, uh, but will bring a steady stream of major benefits to the city, county, and region, in my opinion. Um, the, the, once you get to the point of implementation, um, of course, you, you all know that it will take sustained, rigorous planning and engineering coupled with community engagement to produce infrastructure and land use in complementary fashion. Get the land use, get the infrastructure in place before the land use is occupied. I, in, in my per professional opinion, uh, a truly mixed-use project should be supported with a reasonably high number of homes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evelyn Stivers. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Evelyn Stivers. I work with Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. We work with communities and their leaders to create and preserve quality affordable homes. Um, we're fortunate enough to have an office in San Mateo, right on El Camino Real, in an affordable housing development. And every day, at least three or four people come to our office and seek of housing. Most of these people are working families. They have well, what would can be considered in most parts of the country very well paying jobs and they are struggling. They are struggling to get housed in this area and that's because we've built 56,000 jobs in the last three years in less than 2,000 homes. It's decisions that, that are facing, the, the decision that is facing you is unfortunately not unique on the peninsula. A number of cities are looking at the choice between housing and jobs and choosing only jobs. <laughs> uh, I understand that there's a lot of fear uh, with the housing associated with this development. P some people are concerned that the future residents would have health challenges and others fear that the, this would change the character of your community. Please work with us to overcome those fears. By making a decision to only build jobs in this community, you are not just impacting Brisbane, you are impacting the entire region. We can get to yes. I know you can. So we support the developer's proposal. We think you can come, to a, a, come up with a plan that would allow for housing, allow people to live in your community, allow them to be a part of your community. And I hope we can work with you to get there. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Vincent Wu. Hello, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Vincent. I lived in the Bay Area my entire life, um, mostly in Milpitas or uh, Santa Clara County. Uh, I live in San Francisco now, and I'd like to share a small anecdote about um, a lot of the people I went to high school with. Um, at least five of them have gone on to become teachers either in uh, elementary school, middle school, or high school capacities typically. And a lot of them are struggling not to find a place to work, but a place to live. And how they choose which school district they work for, 
which school they want to go to um, is a really, really tough challenge for them because the way that uh, the teachers' union works and the way that seniority works in schools, you, you're kind of making a very long-term decision for yourself. And the number one thing I hear them talk about is like whether they can get a place to live in the city they want to teach at. And right now, we're seeing Palo Alto struggle to retain teacher talent. They have a lot of money, uh, but the population of Palo Alto doubles or triples every day as everyone commutes there and no one can live there. And they're finding that they literally cannot retain teachers to teach their children. This is a very long-term systemic issue facing almost every municipality in the San Francisco Bay Area region. And you have a lot to gain by permitting a large amount of housing here. You have the opportunity to ensure that your community will be sustainable indefinitely, not just in the environmental sense, which other speakers have addressed, but in the, in the long-term commercial sense, that you will be able to retain quality teachers because your, house, your cost of living is lower than, than in other municipalities. You'll be able to retain quality firefighters, health workers, all the social infrastructure needed to create like a vibrant, functional community. This can only be done with sufficient housing and the decision to not build housing now in the name of retaining some kind of quality of life balance that you see in front of you right now that balance will shift in the future every year that passes that you don't build housing the cost of housing will increase in your locale and there will come a time where you will face perhaps the sort of specter of what Palo Alto is facing which is the literal inability to retain critical social uh, infrastructure just because people can't afford to live here. So I would urge you to reconsider putting off a decision on this topic. I think every year that passes without a decision is a year that property values increases and then rents go up. Or that, that housing delayed is housing denied functionally. So please I urge you to make a responsible long-term decision as early as possible. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Jesse Vaughn. Madam Mayor, uh, City Council, uh, thank you for your time. Um, I'll keep my commentary short because I know you have a lot of people that want to speak. Um, during my day job at Landed, we help um, teachers and school staff uh, access home ownership. As you heard from the previous speaker, this is a very hard job to, to do in the peninsula. Many of the teachers we work with, we hear heart-wrenching stories. Um, people are commuting into our communities two, from two hours away, sometimes even longer. Some are staying in hotels and motels um, for part of the week um, just because the commute is so long. That results in negative educational outcomes. It results in them not being able to stay after school. Um, it's really horrendous for our community. The options for them are, are clearly bad. Um, many of them to rent, they have to rent to save for a down payment, to rent that if they're lucky they can move in with their parents, if they're less lucky they can commute even further, and ultimately um, their options are limited. It's not exclusively teachers that are having a hard time by any means. It expands to all essential workers in our community and it expands to professionals that are, are like myself who would love to enjoy living in your community but just can't access uh, homes even um, today at, at, at their cost. So I would just ask you to consider, um, consider how much of an impact it'll make uh, to, have, to allow these kinds of people to live a little bit closer to your community. As a supporter of housing, I don't, I don't mean to say I want you to build more housing because I think it'll be easy. I'm asking you to do it because, and knowing that it will be hard and that it will mean changes, that it will be challenging for our communities, but knowing also that it is essential for our communities to thrive and uh, develop a, a better future. So thank you for this time. Thank you. Nicole Nebalsi. Hi there. My name is Nicole Nabolsi, and I'm speaking as a law student. I just finished my first year. And I have to say that oftentimes when I'm talking to, m to my colleagues in law school about what we're going to do afterwards, it's serious decisions, especially in this area. And 
With all due respect, I, I hope that you recognize the decision that you make when you vote, how that impacts students like me. Now I'm going on to my second uh, secondary education. Now, they, they say that the average law student in the, one of the top 10 law schools ends up making $60,000 per year. Then you're looking at median income rents in San Francisco of $4,000. This, the decision that you make ultimately determines whether people like me in law, not, not necessarily even able to make over $100,000 as soon as we graduate and with $120,000 worth of law school loans can stay here in the Bay Area. So with all due respect, I hope you make the right decision today. Thank you. Todd David. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Council Members. Uh, Todd David, San Francisco Housing uh, Action Coalition. Uh, first, I would like to just echo what uh, Evelyn Stiver said earlier today. Thank you for continuing this conversation. And you know, I am hopeful that we are going to be able to collectively get to yes and come to a decision that everyone's going to be happy with. So um, you know, I think that progress is being made. And as these conversations continue, I think it's really good. So I want to start with that, and then. I'm going to switch gears. I was contacted by Senator Weiner today, um, and he asked me to read a statement on his behalf. Uh, joining him on uh, in this statement is uh, Assembly Member Mullins, whose uh, staff is here, along with Assembly Member Phil Ting and Assembly Member David Cho. So this is their statement: uh, The Bay Area and California are in this housing crisis for a long list of reasons, but the fundamental issue is that we simply do not have enough housing that our residents can. Ford. California got here as the result of thousands of decisions, like the one being considered by the Brisbane City Council, where the question uh, sh uh, was, should we build housing, and if so, how much housing should we build? Too often the answer has been to either build no housing or to build very little of it. Cities, both large and small, can no longer ignore their role in our regional need for more housing. If we had been more proactive in building housing 10 years ago, we wouldn't be in the mess we are in today. And if we don't start building today, it's going to be even worse 10 years from now. Our housing crisis impacts our residents, our economy, and our environment. The California Legislature has been working on a package of bills that will both increase funding for affordable housing and streamline the process for building housing, including affordable housing. These bills are in response to the clear need to change California's approach to housing, and we're working hard to deliver on these policies. But we also need our local governments to step up and recognize that decisions made by one city impact the entire region. Moving the Baylands development forward with no housing or inadequate housing would be a dramatic lost opportunity to provide housing for thousands of Bay Area residents. By contrast, approving a plan with thousands of homes accessible to public transit would show the kind of local leadership we need if we are going to pull ourselves out of this housing crisis. We urge the Brisbane City Council to put forward a plan that will add significant housing for Bay Area residents who so desperately need it. Once again, and that was from Senator Weiner, Assembly Member Mullins, Assembly Member, Assembly Member Filting, and Assembly Member uh, David Cho. Thank you. Thank Could you. you give that to uh, sure. the City Clerk, please? Yes. Thank you. Stephen Buss. Hi, I'm Stephen Buss. Uh, I live in San Francisco. Uh, like a number of people here and I moved here for a job about a year and a half ago um, I am faced with the uncomfortable reality of being a, a gentrifier uh, you know and I'll admit that I work in tech I moved into the mission historically uh, Latino neighborhood and my presence there you know displaces long-term residents and you know, I lived there because it was the place I could afford. It's near the BART line that I take to work every day. And uh, it's a thriving, wonderful cultural community. But it really pains me that in order to live there, I basically had to force someone out. Um, 
and this is happening because we are not collectively building enough housing. We need to get ahead of this problem. We need to make it so that anyone who wants to live here can move here without having to kick someone else out. And the only way to do that is if we build more housing. So please reconsider not voting on this today and vote yes. Thank you. Tim Collin. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Tim Colin, and I'm speaking on behalf of the 300 members of the San Francisco Housing Action Coalition. There's no denying it. You face a tough vote tonight. And I think the answers we hope to hear tonight sort of go to who are you and what are the values of Brisbane? Where do you stand on the enormous challenges facing California and the Bay Area? You have two competing proposals in front of you. You have the, as I understand it, the city preferred alternative. And the best thing I can say is that it's silly. It's uh, firmly rooted in land use principles from the 1960s. Not only does it not respond to the challenges we face, but it makes them worse, and especially traffic and housing. And you're, you, you can't be unaware of the condition we're in right now. The other proposal is a mixed-use development from UPC, and it's a, good, it's a good idea. It addresses the problems that we face, and I should emphasize it's the type of project that successful cities around the United States are running to build right now. Regardless of how you vote tonight, projects like that are the future. It's hard to imagine that a commercial-only project is going to get built. I, it's not hard to think that there'd be prolonged litigation. It's going to take a lot of time. A small town would need additional sources of revenue to fund ongoing litigation. And as you're increasingly hearing, Sacramento's not likely to be friendly to a commercial-only project. If you vote no, I suppose the best you could hope to do is maybe kick the can down the road for a while, sort of pull the shades down, turn off the porch light, say no one's home, and try hard to prevent change from coming here. But the prospects for that are not good. But if you wanted, and if you saw the benefits, you could face the mixed-use project, the UPC project, squarely, roll up your sleeves, and start negotiating to make it a great project for Brisbane that brought investment and benefits you could never do without, your, uh, uh, do alone, without a project like that. It really could deliver something quite remarkable. The transit investment alone that's being proposed as part of this should be reason enough to approve it without anything else. That's an, uh, there are towns around the Bay Area and state that would kill for an investment like that in transit that will be a benefit to, to Brisbane in decades to come. The mixed-use project could also deliver benefits like, you know, a school, recreational facilities, parks and community spaces you could never do on your own. You have an opportunity to do something truly remarkable for this town. Opportunities like the Baylands, this piece of property, are very, very rare and should not be squandered for being put into the highest and best use, which you're going to hear more and more is something like a mixed-use project like UPC is proposing. And you will be judged on the vote, how you responded at this time with the housing and uh, affordability crisis, our transportation, equity, environmental crises. How, where do you stand on this? What is your choice? I implore you, I implore you to join the Bay Area, join all the communities that are working hard trying to develop solutions to our challenges. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My apologies, this one's hard to read. Laura Foote Clark. <laughs> Hi, uh, Laura Clark. I'm the executive director of Yimby Action. Uh, it's a pro-housing advocacy group. Um, so I hear lots of sad stories all day. Um, but this morning I was on a flight from uh, my home, my 
family's kind of based in a town in Maine, and I was flying in, and someone saw a sticker on my bag that said legalize housing, um, and immediately runs up and says, oh my God, you know, that sticker's so amazing, and as often happens to me, launches into her housing story. And I get these all the time everybody has a housing story and her housing story is that she and her husband are both have good jobs and they're getting raises and they have a special needs child and they cannot afford to remain in the Bay Area and so despite the fact that they have both been given raises and despite the fact that there is a good school here and that they want to remain here um, they're gone now um, so they will be she's flying back home she finally figured out where they're going to live on the east coast and uh, she and her family will be relocating um, and 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 that's it for them they can't hold on anymore um, I then spent the rest of the afternoon going to the RVs along El Camino right by Stanford um, and knocking on doors there and listening to the stories of the people who live in the RVs um, because they can't find housing um, and there were multiple teenagers living uh, with their parents in RVs along there uh, parents who have full-time or two jobs and are struggling to get by and can't find housing in the area but they can find jobs but they can't find housing um, and then I spent uh, the late evening going to the nearby Brisbane trailer park um, and knocking on doors there um, and meeting with a lot of people uh, who also have jobs um, but can't find housing um, and they're in housing um, they're in housing is that is that good enough for you is the housing that they are living in good enough for you? Are you going to be able to, frankly, wake up after you've taken these votes and sleep well, knowing that you have made the crisis worse? I, I hope that you understand the full consequences of this issue. I hope you understand the consequences for your own kids. I hope that you understand that every time you continue to only build jobs and not build housing, we make this problem worse. We make this problem a lot worse. I put off having kids because I wasn't going to be able to get my housing situation right. Um, I have people living in my office at times because they can't find housing. Um, the crisis is at a level that I want the citizens of Brisbane to fully comprehend because I know that there are probably tent encampments in Brisbane. I mean, I haven't, you know, I don't know everything that happens in this town, but I do know that um, there are families living in that trailer park who are struggling. And I hope that you hear their voices as much as you hear everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Sam Moss. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. Uh, thank you for having us here. I really do appreciate it. Um, so my name is Sam Moss. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Mission Housing Development Corporation. We're a 46-year-old nonprofit that builds and owns 100% uh, affordable housing, mostly for families, but also for seniors and, and others. Um, and you know, like I have my dream job. I love it. There is an infinite demand for affordable housing in this city, in this Bay Area. And, you know, the reason there is infinite demand is frankly because of the Brisbane's of the Bay Area. You know, uh, assuming that San Francisco will solve all the housing problems and we can just bring the jobs here. And, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't live in Brisbane. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't afford it. I'd like to point that out. But I live eight miles away, um, and that's really not that far. It is a Bay Area. We live in a Bay Area. We don't all live on little islands that are secluded from each other. And I, I respect your desire to keep your small town feel. Um, while I might not necessarily myself want that, I respect your desire to keep it. I just hope that you know that keeping it negatively affects a gazillion other people who don't have that choice, who can't just move to a small town. And uh, I hope you consider that, both when you're deciding on to not vote, I guess, tonight, and when you finally do decide to vote. So thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Tony Berrios. And Madam Mayor, City Council. First, I'd like to say all these moral arguments about how Brisbane owes the rest of the region and the state to fix the problems that everybody else created that we did not create are hollow arguments. A lot of emotion there and not a lot of logic there. Uh, San Francisco decided a long time ago not to be Hong Kong. They put a moratorium on housing uh, uh, in three quarters of the city, essentially single and one and two units. They could lift that tomorrow. They're not going to do that. Um, we've heard reports here in this chamber, I think it was last, uh, last meeting or, or one before, that something like 40,000 units are already proposed all around us, including 24,000 or so in San Francisco. that will be coming online in the next five or ten years, I guess. Um, so talking about Brisbane like we're in a, a vacuum is a big mistake. And as a matter of fact, just, just on the other side of the border from us in Visitation Valley at the Slage Lock development where the same developer is working there, the city of San Francisco, uh, the residents in that immediate area, just a few hundred of them out of a, a neighborhood with over 20,000, only a few hundred vocal residents work to reduce the size of that project where it could have been much higher density than the 1,700 or so 1,650 or so units that are currently planned there that are currently, the ground has already been broken on that project. And the possibility of other units that the same developer owns very close to that in the executive park in San Francisco with 24-story towers planned. I don't know the total units there, but you're talking about a lot of development that's on the drawing board and um, either approved or close to being approved. So in Brisbane, uh, also to hear that this project is a great project or a visionary project, it, I don't see it that way. And many other people in Brisbane don't see it that way. And we'd be happy to see something that way. I don't see this as being that. Uh, quickly, I'm going to read the letter that I'll turn into uh, Ingrid. Baylands deliberations, why no housing? Housing on the Baylands is currently prohibited. It should not even be up for discussion. Our planning commission recommended a plan they judged to be practical and both environmentally and economically sound. Rather than concentrating on that option as the preferred one, you have spent months laboring over the developer's preferences. On July 24th, Madison Davis raised the question of a general election vote to identify the true public opinion for or against housing on the Baylands. And I followed her idea by suggesting three items be asked. Housing, yes or no. Developer's plan, amend the current Brisbane general plan to allow housing on the Baylands, yes or no. Planning commission recommendation yes or no the belief that the Baylands cannot or will never be made safe for housing may be wrong but it has not been proven wrong more importantly who or what has prevented this property owner from completing remediation of their <clears throat> lands at the top safety standard for housing over the term of their ownership I think no one just their own selfish interest to use the threat of constantly polluted lands as a bargaining chip in their efforts to persuade our city council and voters to give them the unearned gift of billions in additional windfall profits by amending our general plan no one can justify that position by claiming Brisbane is standing in the way of fixing the crisis others may all around us. The regional responsibility argument is a fraud, just like the ABAG plans to include 4,400 new units in Brisbane that we have no intention of ever building. Even if even if they had cleaned up the reme and reme or remediated all of their land already, Brisbane has no obligation to subject itself to either the hypergrowth these public proposals would mean, nor to the potential political power shift which should be expected if our city fails to uphold its own general plan now. It's good to, uh, it's good to finally read that a couple of San Francisco's former mayors, now longer, no longer in office, are willing to admit their city's part in creating this housing crisis. However, while San Francisco failed again to maximize density at this developer's Slage Lock site, uh, they want us 
to build more. Settling, it's, they say it's selfish not to embrace the end of our small town quality of life as they seek to dictate our future for uh, to us on their own for their own benefit. I suggest you go first. Lift all the height and density restrictions throughout San Francisco, Daly City, and South San Francisco, and leave us to decide the little that we have a right to control. Housing and environmental advocates are reported to have suggested our Baylands fill is just piles of dirt, not worthy of anything but the same sprawl they so much argue against in other locations. That is hypocritical. Many who build over, uh, many would build over in Golden Gate Park if they got a chance to, and I would rather see Brisbane facilitate the building of the next great park right here, complete with its own energy farm. The, the great lie is that many small towns like Brisbane owe anything to the great cities around us. Every problem has a solution, some better than others, some far worse. We in Brisbane have have the courage to seek the highest value use and not allow ourselves to be bullied into accepting the, t the tired old lies that more housing will really help end the imbalance which is proven to be beyond simple supply and demand. Change in the right direction is okay, to paraphrase Winston Churchill. This developer plan is the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you. Theodore Randolph. Mm. Hello, I am Theodore, a uh, resident of San Francisco, and um, um, and I want to point out that um, um, this is not uh, trying to build housing in the Baylands is not uh, not just about regional responsibility or, or anything like that. It's about uh, giving people access to opportunities. Uh, clearly. Uh, clearly, you think that there would be that there is opportunity, uh, more ability to have jobs because uh, because of considering the pl uh, plan to build uh, more offices, uh, more factories and stuff without um, without any housing. But um, but if you do that, then uh, then the people who are becoming for these opportunities will, ha will have to be commuting from uh, long distances away, and all of the uh, all the profits, uh, all of the value that they would be generating here would be uh, eaten up by high um, high fees, um, uh, high rental fees, a high land fee, uh, land on, uh, high land costs, high home costs, and, uh, and by greenhouse gas emissions as they commute from long distances away. Um, and also I am um, Historically, people have, when people have had opportunities, pe um, people have moved into city uh, cities, and then cities have grown to accommodate the people to get um, so they can have access to those opportunities. Um, uh, cities regularly used to grow over 100% uh, within 10 years, and uh, and they became better for having more people. Uh, um, they became better for having uh, more homes for people to live, and so um, so I want you to consider uh, um, yeah, making uh, making Brisbane uh, better uh, by giving more people places to live. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Razicki. Jim, Jimmy Sosa. Thank you. So, uh, I live in Brisbane. I moved here in 1982. And I picked this town because it reminded me of Sausalito. And if you've ever been to Sausalito, there's nobody builds around there. Nobody. You leave it the way it is. It's beautiful. Brisbane's the same way. I see all these people come up here to talk. They say, we live in San Mateo County. You don't live in Brisbane. You can't talk from my town. This is my town. This is where I live. This is where I raise my children. I'm a grandfather. My grandchildren live here now. You people that want to move in here, sorry to hear it. But you know what? None of you know what the rent's even going to be like. You students. Who are struggling? Can I get it. Jamie, My daughter's a student. Uh, excuse me, struggling. Mr. Spencer. Could we get you to speak yeah, in sorry, the microphone? But um, there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to afford a place in the Baylands. 
So has anybody given you what a rental cost is going to be, what a home is going to cost? I haven't seen any figures on what a one bedroom is going to go for. How do you know that everything you're trying to put all your energy here is going to pay out for you? You still may not make it here. There's the young lady that spoke for San Mateo County. I work for San Mateo County. I'm a social worker. I help homeless people all the time. The problem isn't the housing. It's the problem is that the people that live in this county can't afford it anymore. And and other people that are coming in, the dot commerce and other folks who have a lot of cash are moving these poor families out. That's the housing problem. People can afford it, but just not the people that live here anymore. Not the people that grew up here, born and raised in this county. Okay, so you folks, you students, I feel for you. It's a tough, it's a tough game, but there's no guarantee you're going to be able to afford an apartment in the Baylands. Because anybody giving you what the rent's going to cost? I doubt it, because I haven't seen it in print yet. I see a lot of greedy people wanting to build this thing up really quick without any real clear investigation of even who this this person that's funding this whole project is. Supposedly this person is in Asia somewhere. We don't even know his name. Could he be a gangster? We don't know. We don't know nothing, because nobody wants to give up his name. Right? Let's put this man in print. You people want to stand up here and talk about housing. Let's find out who this person is. He may be just taking your money. You don't know that. The traffic problem. We're going to have a huge traffic problem. Levi Stadium spent millions of dollars on traffic studies. Do you think they got it right? No. Try to get out to a game. You spend more time in traffic than you do in the stadium. And that's with millions of dollars in traffic study and with all these little traffic uh, transit lines built, these rails to get people in and out they still a mess. So we haven't done all that. And if anybody's noticed the traffic here, we got Bay Shore, two lanes going this way, and we got the one-on-one, -on -one, and we got Tunnel Road. That's, it's a mess in the morning when you're trying to get to work. Don't imagine 10,000 more people being thrown into that little box out there. Let's build a park. Let's build a place, recreational area for children so they can get out and start getting out a little bit more, give up that TV and those little, you know, texting, and let's build something else. I'm in, I'm in line for a park. But I also understand that that area may be toxic and contaminated. We don't know. Again, I just jumped into this three weeks ago, and I'm finding out a lot more than I did when I first started hearing about the Bayland. So to you, I say, collectively, no. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Laksamana. Nancy Laksamana, Brisbane resident. It's a tough act to follow Jimmy, the soccer coach, my son, but I don't agree. Um, 30 years Brisbane resident, 25 years Visitation Valley. So we have a 50-year-old dump. Why are we trying to save it? I mean, you know, really, why are we trying to save it? We have had all this history to save San Bruno Mountain. We probably have that in jeopardy now, to be honest with you, though I would fight it with you, Terry, all the way. But this is a dump. This is a rail yard that can be, with remediation, housing put on it. You know what? Why are we trying to save it? I mean, let's do the right thing. This is the right thing to do. It's the right time. It's what you all have to consider. I respect that. But it is the right time, and it's the right thing to do. Housing, yes. Thank you. Tom Bellino. Hello, uh, my name is Tom, and by the grace of luck and charitable friends with Rent Control Departments, I live next door in San Francisco. Uh, last time I spoke to you all, I rattled off some facts and figures, and I'm guessing you might have heard a lot of those by now, so I'll go more personal this time. Uh, growing up in Chicago, I loved learning about the earth and animals and nature, and my favorite day of the year was Arbor Day, because we got to take a tree sapling home from school and plant it. I knew that planting trees would help reduce pollution and make the earth better for everyone. I didn't know why more people didn't plant trees everywhere. Flash forward an undisclosed number of years, and I eventually became involved in local politics, first in Chicago and now in the Bay Area. While I might be upset when a candidate I like doesn't win or a bill I like doesn't pass, I usually understand the logic of the opposition. In the case of whether to build housing near transit like at Baylands, given all the facts that we've all heard, 
It is so undeniably the right thing to do, and it is so dismaying that the council might vote against it. It is so clear that it is the right thing to do for the housing scarcity crisis and reducing car emissions that I just do not understand how, after serious thought, someone could be against it. You might wonder why so many people are here from neighboring communities. Well, for me, riding my bike here after work is my adult version of planting a tree. I guess I'll never shake it. It just feels like the right thing to do. So I must plead with you to do the right thing. Allow this once in a generation opportunity for transit oriented housing at the Baylands. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Salmon. Michelle Salmon, Brisbane resident. Um, I don't want you to certify the ARR, and I don't want you to approve the developer's plan. And my objection isn't because Brisbane's character might change. I've lived through many changes. I've lived here all my life. My mother lived here all of her life. And if things didn't change, life wouldn't go on. But the real objection to housing isn't the growth of Brisbane. It's the inadequacy of the environmental impact review and the lack of actual cleanup plans and closure of the landfill. Yes or no, maybe, not negotiable. Even one housing unit shifts the burden of infrastructure to the public, and that's where the real money lies for the developer. We've talked a lot about the regional welfare doctrine and our regional responsibilities. And if you are looking at regional responsibilities, you should be looking at the regional benefits that that area could give us in terms of energy production, high-speed rail, and what could affect us at a more intrinsic level than being able to go to zero waste right there at Recology. And I just feel that going out and building more housing isn't going to solve the housing crisis at all. It, we have a housing crisis, we have a population crisis is what we really have. In San Francisco, tried to address it many years ago back in the 80s they had something called the St. Francis Housing Authority where when they built these big buildings those buildings had to contribute to public housing projects. San Francisco took the money but I sure didn't see the public housing projects from that funding that they got and it continues. I mean, you talk about a bi-county um, or a multiple county, sorry, um, priority development area, but look at the Salesforce Tower. Where is the housing from San Francisco for that? And even on this project, if you just look at the developer's plan, they're talking a mere 4,400 and something units of housing against 8 to 12 million square feet of commercial space, whatever kind of commercial space that is. Well, that's oh, right up there with that ratio that people were talking about, about one housing unit to every eight jobs. You think this is going to be any better? Do you think this is going to address the problem? No. What this does is shift the burden to the public for the infrastructure for the developer. Follow the money people. I was so so disappointed at one of these last meetings when all the housing advocates came and Greenbelt Alliance stood up and endorsed the developer's plan and I asked the young man who spoke oh you know how much did they pay you to do that oh I don't know they didn't pay it well I went and looked up their financial report and guess what yes they did they had they had a fundraiser for this for the Greenbelt Alliance and they're also a major contributor and about a fifth of the annual budget comes from the San Francisco Housing Action Coalition and their 300 members who aren't people, they're developers. So let's just really be clear about who is populating this room here. And, and the developer has really done their job to bring out and try to make you feel guilty. And you know what? We shouldn't squander this property. We should put it to the highest and best use. And we should work on solutions for our challenges. And we should look at the consequences for our kids your kids, their kids, whoever kids. You know, Jerry Hill's office is completely right. This is a rare and important opportunity to do the right thing for future generations. Do you think the right thing for future generations is to add another drop in the bucket of, of housing? Or is it to do renewable energy, water conservation, <sighs> zero waste, you get the picture. So you want to do something rare and important, do it, uh, take the opportunity to do something for the public, have the courage to stand up against all of these paid housing advocates, 
all the me, 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 I want, I want, I want, and do something that really will benefit not just one future generation, but multiple future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Hexter? Yes. Got it right. Thank you, Madam Mayor, City Council. Uh, I just want to, uh, I'm a local climate activist. I used to live in San Mateo County, essentially priced out of the county. Not only that, but I live now in Alameda County. But I want to uh, talk a little bit and present this and put this into the, uh, g give this to um, the clerk. Uh, what the basically, uh, I want to talk about greenhouse gas emissions, which is one of the issues here. There are a lot of people here talking very articulately about the human cost of not building housing, but we also have the greenhouse gas emissions that are caused by our, our lifestyle. In other words, the way we live now is unsustainable. Okay, uh, living in suburbs or in sprawling suburbs, we're dependent on fossil fuels. And California in particular, our, our emissions are lower than other uh, areas of the country because of our mild climate. But um, we really have a, a very big transportation emissions problem. Here you have the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, inventory from uh, ARB, okay, in Sacramento. And you see the big slice here is transportation emissions. This is us driving our cars around because we live very far, many of us live very far from our work and far from the things we want to do. So uh, building, not building housing here will cause this to either remain the same, okay, this big slice, 39%, or will cause it to grow, okay. Uh, building more commercial development here and uh, without housing, without a substantial housing proportion, will make this grow because of all those people coming over. The, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the Olive Mount Pass, among other places, and also just from the Tri-Valley area to jobs here in San Mateo County. So I, I want you to consider uh, voting on and approving the uh, proposal for more housing here on this property. And other than that, I have nothing else to say. Thank you. And if you could provide that to our city clerk. Thank you. Danny Ames. Thank you, Consul. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for, for listening to the residents of Brisbane. Um, you know, there should be reasonable respect for Brisbane as well. We have a general plan that was thought uh, in 1994. Uh, so planning history decisions are not made lightly around here. Uh, I see a real insensitivity to the will of our community. There's a constitution of the United States where there's a constitution of Brisbane as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the local leadership has really been terrific to the residents here and I like to see it to continue to be that way. Uh, but there are outside influences. Uh, Mayor Ed Lee cutting the corporate tax in half has created this tech boom. Um, you know, there's several values uh, at play here and I think uh, you guys have had the, the finger wagged at you uh, from from many places and a lot of them are out of town. I would like to remind um, you guys what um, the general plan is in 1994 chapter 3 community community character I'd like to read that the city of Brisbane and its mountain will remain a place of independent and distinct with a small town quality and a volunteer spirit where diversity is welcome and everybody can participate in town meetings and elected officials carefully consider the desires and the needs of the citizens and government through circumscribed rules and regulations only as required for the public health and safety and protection of the environment. I'd like to go on a little bit more. This is about Brisbane and its mountain, its stands, more than a thousand feet high, this great outcropping of rock and scrub brush that surrounds the town like a pair of loving hands, isolating Brisbane from the busy metropolis grown up around, preserving here a time capsule of the way life was years ago, quiet, unhurried, comfortable in its familiarity with the land. Walter Blum wrote that. 
I want to carry on with another, uh, just two more paragraphs. It looks like I've got time. Um, Many factors contribute to the sense of security and well-being of the members of a community, including family, shelter, food, and safety. In Brisbane, this sense of security and well-being is also provided by San Bruno Mountain. There, a very personal feeling in Brisbane about the mountain, as former Mayor Anya Miller said in 1975, you're protected in a way, this is what makes us a community. We all look out for each other, and this bowl and there is a feel of neighborhood that you don't get in other towns. This chapter attempts to capture the importance of how the mountain looks and feels to Brisbane and how we can be good stewards for it. San Bruno Mountain rises above the San Francisco Bay and dominates the landscape of northern San Mateo County. Despite all the development in its valleys and on its slopes, it retains the character of what it may have looked like to the Custodian Indians and Spanish explorers. The bushlands, the grasslands still mix with the sharp roll oak and coastal sage growing in their native habitat. On the sheltered eastern side of the mountain, Owl and Buckeye Canyons face northerly and contain the largest woodland communities. The mountain is a habitat for many small animals, including meadow mice, ground squirrels, moles, raccoons, rabbits, opossums, and even foxes. The significance of San Bruno Mountain lies in its role as a natural protector from the elements, a habitat for protected and endangered species, a course for carrying storm waters and centerpiece of local identity and history, a resource for recreational activities, a definer of geographical identity within its bowl, and an enduring source of visual beauty. At this point, I'd like you to, in its current form, deny UPC's application until they can come back with something more reasonable. I'm against the potential of gridlock. Freaks out a lot of people around here. And um, the town character is at stake. Please keep it the way we love it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Jonathan Sharfman. Madam Mayor, Council, and um, thank you for your very dedicated and diligent work on this and this is the twelfth year I've been standing before before you especially Mr. Conway here and I sincerely thank you for your consideration while this process has been long and sometimes difficult uh, UPC's approached it with four touchstones we've tried to create a project we've tried to nurture a project that's healthy for the planet and consistent with Brisbane's core values, right for the region, good for Brisbane, and feasible for UPC or any successors for UPC to build. We know that this council is skeptical about whether new housing and significant numbers of new jobs are good for Brisbane. I personally respect that. I want you to know I personally respect that struggle but the strategic location of this site next to major public transit systems makes this a once in a generation opportunity and we hope that Brisbane overcomes its reservations and sees the opportunity to, cr to clean up and transform the Baylands create great accessible open space attract new businesses and shopping opportunities and recreational opportunities to the area and help solve some of the greatest challenges of our time that have been talked about uh, in many different ways over the years here. We also want to remind you as I have before uh, that we stand ready to work with you to move forward with a project that is healthy, right, good, and feasible. Thank you. Thank you. Alfred Tubb. Hi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alfred, and I come here from Berkeley tonight. And if you're wondering why did I make the trip all the way across the bay for this, it's because this is a regional issue. I understand the concerns that the residents here have 
about the environment, about potential for solar panel generation of energy or for a park there, I understand their concern for a small town feel. I think that's also a red herring because, as they say, when you're looking for a problem, follow the money. And when, what I've seen is that what the city of Brisbane is considering right now is not the choice between housing and a park. It's a choice between housing and a massive commercial development of hotels, office parks, and retail. I looked at your budget. Most of your money comes from sales taxes, hotel taxes, special business taxes charged to ecology and other businesses. You want to make money off people visiting, shopping, playing, recycling in the Bay Area? Fine. Everybody does. That's perfectly understandable. But, however, to do that without providing the places for the workers who generate that wealth to live is irresponsible at best. Some might even call that freeloading, expecting other cities to take up the cost of educating and housing the people who work and make the Bay Area run and provide the places for people to visit and play and shop. In my city of Berkeley, we have been taxing ourselves vast amounts of money to plug the hole in housing and education that places like Brisbane have left us. Just last year, we raised taxes on ourselves, $4 million just for affordable housing in the city of Berkeley. Additional millions of dollars for public schools that the people living in these new homes will attend. On the 28th ballot, we're probably going to go back for more because we're far from enough. We have over a thousand people homeless in our city of Berkeley. And that's not even counting the people who are doubled up due to a bedroom. So, in this room here, yes, there are the residents of your town that you represent. But there's also many of the current and future leaders of other parts of the Bay Area, other parts of the state. And we don't like what we see here, this choice to build all this commercial development of the city's preferred option without providing any housing for the people who live there. And we're going to remember that. When it comes time for us to decide, okay, let's say I have a friend coming from out of town. They need a place to stay in a hotel. I'll tell them, don't stay in Brisbane. And my friend, when the holidays come around, and my friends are going holiday shopping, I'll tell them, don't shop in Brisbane. No homes, no shop. Boycott Brisbane. That, this is, we're going to make this blow up. For every person you see here in this room, there are at least several dozen more following this online, on Twitter, <coughs> on the internet, on our mailing list, and we are going to remember this because you cannot do this to the rest of the Bay Area, taking our money, wanting our sales tax revenue, but not providing homes. And so, I'll leave you with this. You really have three choices. You have the commercial development, you have the housing development, and you can just leave the site as it is. For, for preferably, I would like to see housing built there. But if you can't do that, and if you're really genuine about preserving the small town feel, I better see a park there. Because if what ends up happening there is commercial development, well, all those arguments about the polluted land, about the traffic, that's just baloney. Because you'll see even more of that. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Seeloff. Madam Mayor, Council, thank you very much for your time this evening. My name is Sarah Seeloff. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Creative Land Recycling. We're a national nonprofit based in Oakland. You've heard from me several times. We've been down as an independent educational resource to serve the city, uh, to serve the Council and its staff. And I'm here tonight to offer you some more resources and comment a little bit about remediation uh, in response to some of the, the comments that I've heard. First, resources. Wanted to make you aware that on October 12th in Redwood City, in partnership with San Mateo County, 
we will be hosting a luncheon and a workshop focused on infill housing. It's going to be a great day. We encourage you to come down. We'd love to host you. Um, we also have a variety of resources on our website. Recently we've had a series of webinars that you may find interesting. We had one called When Life Hands You a Landfill, focused on landfill remediation. It's available, recorded on our website, all free. Uh, we have another uh, website, or excuse me, we have another webinar that was just completed uh, called Remediation 101. So should you or your constituents be in need of any kind of information about cleanup, you can find it there. And then finally we have more webinars stretching out. Uh, our next one is going to be September 13th and that will be focused on in situ remediation. So in other words, solutions that don't involve digging and hauling and placing tons of dirt into trucks um, and pumping carbon into the air. We are also uh, getting ready to release a white paper that provides an easily digestible resource uh, for decision makers like you and your constituents. Uh, it is not yet in final form, but I went ahead and shared it with the city staff um, so that you'll have a copy in case it's useful. Um, I want to switch now to talking about remediation. Uh, CCLEAR typically does not advocate for a particular end use, but I do want to comment specifically on housing because there's been a lot of talk about that tonight. Uh, we have seen land safely remediated and reused for a plethora of end uses, including the ones that you are considering tonight, including housing. Uh, in Sacramento, there are two rail yards under redevelopment. There will be housing on both of those sites. Truckee is breaking ground on a, uh, a redevelopment of a rail yard. Um, and landfills get redeveloped all the time. The highest grossing Home Depot in the country, fun fact, is right up the road in Colma, and it's built on a former landfill. Um, there was a comment made earlier about uh, the about toxic land, and there's a lot of fear around contamination. Uh, and I do want to point out that, you know, as uh, I, I noted on June 15th when I was here with a colleague who helped shape the redevelopment of Emeryville, um, that remediation costs money. It's paid for by the development of the site. That's the, the trade-off that's made. It's not a political statement. It's an economic fact, and so I just wanted to get that out there for the record. Uh, remediation is a highly regulated process, as you're no doubt aware, and there are opportunities for public engagement. Um, um, finally, I did want to comment that zero waste, water conservation, green energy, and um, other green goals are not mutually exclusive uh, from the world of housing, of mixed-use development, of all the things that we're talking about tonight. Indeed, a pillar of our national programs is to focus on climate-forward redevelopment. So in other words, we see redevelopment as an opportunity to start tabula rasa from the ground up. You have a chance uh, to start from scratch, and the sky is the limit. We all recognize that the climate is changing. And so what we at CCLEAR try to do is to pull together those examples of super green redevelopment from across the country because we don't know what the climate is necessarily going to look like in 25 or 50 years. So we had better be very forward leaning when we have the chance to make decisions about it today. And so we're here as a resource for you. The sky's the limit. Um, I encourage you to think about what will keep the sky blue and not smogged in. Um, and to you and your residents, please do count us as a resource. Um, our, we offer our services uh, free of charge or at very low cost in the case of some of our workshops. We obviously have a lot coming down the pike here in the Bay Area. Um, and we've been here for you throughout many of these deliberations, and we want to continue to be here for you you as a resource. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And can you let us know what is your website where we can find yes. those webinars? www.cclr.org and I will send a link to Ingrid. Great. Madam Mayor, do you mind if we take a five minute break? Sure, that's fine. So we'll adjourn for a five minute break. Thank you. Adina Levin. Oh, I think she's outside. We'll just. Yeah, Beretta. <laughs> Adina Levin, would you like to come up next or finish your burrito? <laughs> You're next. <laughs> or we can skip over you. Skip over. Okay. Not in. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, Thank you very much. Um, good evening, Council Members Adina Levin with Friends of Caltrain. And um, there's a, a lot of talk this evening about housing and the role, potential role of housing in addressing the regional housing crisis. Um, but um, one of the things that I wanted to, what I wanted to talk about, um, I wasn't able to attend the last couple of meetings, but I did watch a fair amount of them on uh, YouTube. And I wanted to address uh, a few of the questions that came up regarding the relationship to housing and traffic and addressing some of the concerns um, relating to potentially having a mixed-use development. So the first um, question um, that, so uh, one of the questions that was asked at one of the couple of previous meetings was, gee, if you do infill development and, and particular housing, won't that increase traffic congestion? I mean, isn't that logical that you have more people, you're going to have some more cars, even if they are car light? Won't that increase congestion, won't driving slow down? And um, so um, earlier today, I sent an email with some resources. There's some uh, very good research that is out um, relatively recently showing that when there is infill development, including um, housing near jobs and services, yes, um, driving uh, may in fact slow down. There may be more local traffic congestion. And so then the question, arise as well if you are adding housing your jobs, reducing vehicle miles traveled, people are driving less long, but that, that has a negative local impact. You're helping the region, but you're harming yourself. But what that research actually shows is that in areas that do the infill development, while people may drive slower, the amount of time they spend driving decreases because accessibility increases. You have more locations to get to within a short distance, and therefore you spend overall less time driving, even though that the time that you are driving um, may be slower, and there is some um, good research showing that in a variety of studies, um, and so feel free to, to take a look at the references in the email um, regarding that. Um, another thing that came up has to do with, well, um, how is it possible to create a car light neighborhood? And I wanted to forward some things that the city of Mountain View has been um, working on for potentially adding uh, up to about 10,000 units of housing near the offices in North Bay Shore where Google is. So they are, they have set a goal for 0.6 units of, so 0.6 parking spaces per housing unit. And um, in order to adapt to that, because there's so much commercial space and they're planning on adding more uh, uh, retail and services, they are planning on doing shared parking and therefore allowing some of the commercial parking that is um, you know, nearly empty in the evening to be available for some of the residential parking to be able to um, handle that and also be able to um, when having unbundled parking to be able to have some flexibility. So that is um, something that they're doing. They have a goal of having a car light area. They're really improving the transit. They're making the area super walkable. And then they're setting that goal for the low um, parking to help reduce the traffic. And then the last point I wanted to make is to uh, step back and look at the bigger picture in terms of the relationship between housing and transportation. Um, enabling this development to be successful on the commercial side um, and any housing side is going to take a lot of transportation investment. And the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and ABAG have just approved the latest Plan Bay Area and the Action Plan which has a goal of addressing the things in that plan that were still going in the wrong direction in terms of mega commutes and in terms of displacement. They had um, two new strategies. One was conditioning transportation funding on cities' production of housing, not just the little One Bay Area grant program that it has been, uh, had a number of conditions for the last few years, but potentially the larger pots of funding that are really needed for the types of infrastructure that would make this um, work. And then the other one is um, having policies to 
uh, in, uh, in, in sense and the balancing of housing with transit oriented jobs. So it's not clear exactly how those will play out and exactly how they will be implemented, but this is something that has been approved and therefore um, having the housing and the mixed use may turn out to be important and needed in order to make this work in any form. Thank you. Thank you. Clara Johnson. I think you should be at peace because I, you know, if, if you're going to be insulted, threatened, and intimidated, you should have your constituents do it. <laughs> I'm trying to make you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, I admire the the uh, the spirit and the dedication of all the people who come from other communities, because they're working for something that they really believe in, and what they don't evidently realize is that we believe in trying to treat people fairly as well. But we would like to exist as we have existed, in a, at least in in uh, our character of the, our community. And you're going to build Parkside, which they may not know about, which does fulfill I. I think our fair share of the Bay Area's housing. If you're going to have around 300 units there or close to it and you're still looking for more projects, that will, I think, be something that makes sense for the community and also helps the region. So thank you. My prepared remarks, uh, I have uh, given them to Ingrid. And I wanted to tell you that I watched your July 26th meeting yesterday and read the staff report today. And I appreciate the numerous questions that you ask. I have some comments and some questions, and I've organized them by subject because all that numbering that was repetitive was driving me crazy. Regulators and remediation. BCDC has jurisdiction over portions of the Baylands. The city should make contact with them and let them know where we are in the process and ask them for their comments because you asked that question somewhere and someone told you they hadn't talked to them in a long time. Well, give, why don't you give them, have the staff give them a call, you know, so you know the current what they're thinking and what you're, you know, what you're thinking. Because to me, for somebody to say, well, 18 months ago I knew what they wanted, well, check it out now to find out so, and tell them where we are. Uh, the, there are more than 80,000 known chemicals and only a few hundred of them have been evaluated for their impact on human health. There are more chemicals on the Bayland than those listed in the monitoring report, and the actual health risk is greater than is acknowledged. The problem is that the regulation of, of uh, toxic chemicals is sadly inadequate, and uh, we, can't <laughs> we can't change that at the moment. But I think we should all work to have it improved so there's a better understanding of what the risk is. The discussions you have had about the tremendous amount of soil placed on the site don't ever include the fact that that soil is required to separate the public from the contamination and it must be approved by DTSC Regional Water Quality Control Board or as the staff report mentioned Cal Recycle. The soil for OU1 and OU2 needs to be of a type and soil pore size that is appropriate to act as a barrier and the soil they brought in is all they don't know that you know, they haven't done it that way. They've just been giving us fees and piling thousands of cubic yards on there, which they may have to remove in order to put the proper soil there. I think they, it's much more of a mess, I think, than they acknowledge to the city because they don't, they, they have not made a deal yet, as I understand it with DTSC at least, about that. It's not resolved. And they have to they have to satisfy the regulators. So I think that should be mentioned when you're talking, because there's, you, you were talking about moving the soil as though there was no one else involved, and there definitely is. Also, before 2010, the, the soil was not adequately t tested and they've been, they've been ordered to test it all in lots of something like a thousand cubic yards. There are plans that UPC has agreed to make sure that the regulator standards for that are met. I don't know the Cal Recycle requirements, but I think it would be similar. 
Recreation, all infrastructure, this is a uh, question someone asked, all infrastructure is supposed to be paid for by the developer. Playing fields are infrastructure. So they should be, their recreation infrastructure, they should be paid for by them. In an earlier Baylands presentation, Ms. Dangemal of Dangemal Landscape Architectural Firm said that she found a study indicated that there are, has been interaction between chemicals used to treat turf and the chemicals that were part of the contamination of the soil underlying that turf. So this issue should be investigated before you place playing fields anywhere on the Baylands. As long as you can get some information, make sure you're not creating a problem. Golden State Lumber, since the staff hasn't t spoken to them in 18 months, it would be wise if they touch base with Golden State Lumber. They can tell you what they're thinking, you can tell them where the project is. Water supply. During the EIR process, you use an attorney who specializes in water issues. Why not bring her back to review the current circumstances? She might provide more information regarding the probability of water being available for the project. The agreement made the agreement to make an agreement for the OID water doesn't mean much unless there are agreements with MID and SF. PUC, who have both said that there isn't enough information in the AR to know whether they could accommodate our needs or not. If all the water available to use is pledged to others, then we're out of luck. It seems like an unreliable source of water. The pressure on water resources is increasing with population. The past is not a good predictor of future availability. Landfill. According to Dr. Lee, long-term post-closure municipal landfill failures after 20 years or more occur fairly frequently, leaving the host municipality to pay for repairs. We must be certain to protect against this possibility. Traffic, parking, greenhouse em gas emissions, and transit. Where is the evidence that reducing parking well below the expected needs for developments actually reduced car usage and greenhouse gas emissions, and by how much? The report just lists cities that have done this. Uh, a former planning director told me once that it was kind of wishful thinking <laughs> that if you start looking at usage, car usage, people driving alone, those figures don't change that much. So um, if you're going to just, you, know, you take away the parking, make neighborhoods absolutely impossible to park, then you ought to be sure that there's actually going to be a payoff. And I think there may be uh, information available that could tell you that, you know, that how many how many trips or they have taken a certain area. You could try to find it. The, the table on page 13 of your staff report indicates that after the project, the LOS will be 50 seconds at some end, more than 50 seconds or 80 seconds at other intersections. Any number above 80 seconds, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 12 minutes, is not a very helpful table. Noise, item number 26, the noise metric should be expressed in DBA to link it to human hearing and perhaps a CNEL number should be given so you'd have an idea of the impact of the sound over the course of a day. The liability for this project should be assigned to the developer in any and all agreements signed by the city. It's not only sea level rise, but also chronic inundation that's a problem with sea level rise. The Union of Concerned Scientists has republic, published a report on areas that will be inundated by flooding caused by sea level rise. And we should ask for a detailed copy of that report because it's difficult to read the map that the public can get on the internet. And I think we find that helpful. The San Mateo level report, the San Mateo sea level rise report, is very con uh, very conservative. It says 6.6 .6 feet is the outside high number, not according to everyone else. That's an old figure. Uh, I'm almost done. And uh, you can decide not to approve any project because you have an inadequate EIR. The renewable energy alternative without so much curb social space looks good for the town and the environment. Excuse me. Toxics must be monitored and if they start to move the owner has to do something about it no matter what you do. They can't just sit there and let them start moving because that's when they, the regulators will move. Thank you very much. Thank you Claire. Victoria Fierce. Hi. 
my name is Victoria Fierce, and uh, I live in Oakland. And I don't know how to explain to you that you should care about other people. Uh, our disagreement is not merely political. It's a fundamental divide on what it means to live in a society. The Brisbane Baylands is a unique opportunity to take a stance against homelessness, and we need a grand vision of the future where homelessness is unheard of. And of course, we need strong leadership to take us there. A Bay Area for all of us requires us, absolutely requires us, to work towards environmentally sustainable housing for the entire community. It also requires that we do not privilege the concerns of the securely housed over those that are not. I am white, and I recognize the privilege that this gives me. But also, let's interrogate what I'm up against. My rent is $2,000 a month. If I hustle, I can just barely afford it and still maybe have bus fare to get to the doctor for my medications. I live with my partner, not by choice, but by circumstance. We're both millennials, which means we've inherited an earth depleted of its resources and a great American society pillaged of its wealth by the generation before me. Cities are going bankrupt. Teachers have to have fundraisers to buy their students pencils, while the Air Force dumps billions of dollars of college tuition money on fighter jets that can't fly in the rain. Millionaires in luxury single-family homes on the Brisbane Hills enjoy their views and their exclusive neighborhood character, while kids in Fruitvale drink water that is more toxic than that in Front, Michigan. I don't know how to tell you how you should care about other people. We, again, must not privilege the concerns of the securely and comfortably housed over those that are not. I'm a millennial, as I said. You may have heard the news that my generation is killing avocado toast, fidget spinners, the private car, and yes, even casual sex. But you know what? Our housing shortage is killing more people than millennials ever will. Go ahead and call us entitled. We selfishly demand safe, affordable housing. We selfishly demand a seat at the table. We selfishly demand our right to the city. And we selfishly, shamelessly, without pause, demand that the city of Brisbane build more housing. There are, of course, consequences to denying housing. I'm an organizer. I connect people. And I give them the tools to solve their problems in their own communities. But I'm not just an organizer. I'm a Yimby. Yimbys get housing built, and Yimbys show up. It doesn't depend on Brisbane whether or not we exist. We certainly exist. Whether you like it or not, history is on our side. We have momentum. We have a base. We get people elected. We move votes. We are Yimbys. We are young. We are born from you. We will outlive you. We will bury you. Thank you. Tell me. Christina Fernandez. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. My name is Christina Fernandez, and I work for SAMCEDA, or the San Mateo County Economic Development Association. Uh, SAMCEDA represents a contingent of leading Bay Area businesses, institutions, organizations, and entrepreneurs. Uh, we are recognized for our experienced, impact-driven approach as a business advocacy organization. As companies seek to grow and expand in San Mateo County, there are two primary factors for choosing the right location on the peninsula. First, if housing is nearby or adjacent, and secondly, if public transportation is readily available. While there is a significant amount of housing under development in San Francisco near the Baylands, including Schlage Lock, Candlestick, and Hunters Point, it is not sufficient to meet the housing needs of the peninsula or the needs of growing companies looking for growth opportunity sites on the peninsula. With Caltrain already on site and a site large enough to accommodate a wide range of uses, housing needs to be a part of the equation. World-class office space alone will not be nearly as attractive to future users as office space with adjacent housing. This is the reality of our new economy and an essential ingredient to, in our region's sustainability model, and it cannot be overstated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Karen Cunningham. Honorable Mayor, City Council, Karen Cunningham. Um, it's really interesting to listen to all of this stuff, and if I were to recommend anything to you all tonight, I would say you can't vote on this. Um, 
What's really interesting to me is to hear, and I'm, I, you know, if I had my druthers, I would say, let's get a group together that is city council, that is residents, that is non-residents, that is renters, that is owners, that is building owners, that is the city council, that is the city staff, that is everybody, and try and figure out how to solve our regional housing crisis, which I certainly understand is a huge issue and is awful. Um, you know, we have one one police officer who lives here in town. We have none of our fire department who lives in town. We have a handful of our uh, teachers who live in town, and you know, that's really sad to me. And I would love to resolve that. But Brisbane did not create the housing crisis that's in the Bay Area. Uh, that just blows my mind to continue to hear this. We did not create the housing crisis that is in the Bay Area, and we should not be the solution to the entire Bay Area housing crisis. Um, I, I understand that, you know, our developers and you know the people from San Francisco want places to live, um, and and I'm I'm all for finding solutions. I I really am. Um, you guys know me, you know I've got a big heart, you know I, f I find it really disheartening that you know the people who serve us cannot live here. I I've, it just it's not good to me. Uh, but thanks to the senators and others outside of Brisbane for their comments on Brisbane. If Brisbane solved the collective Bay Area housing issues we would still be way behind the requirements that they say is needed. San Francisco has 30,000 vacant apartment buildings, houses right now, that because of their own rules, are, the, the people who own these places don't have them out there for rent. Don't look at Brisbane and say, we now need to solve that problem. San Francisco needs to solve their problems before they start pointing their fingers at us. And I understand that there's a San Francisco Housing Coalition. Love you guys. I have a millennial son. I, I get all of that stuff. But, you know, San Francisco has been building high-end luxury condos. San Francisco has been building all of these commercial buildings. Now they want to turn around and say, it's on you, Brisbane to solve that issue. Even if we solve the issue, which they say is 10,000 housing units short, we're not going to come close, even if we built those 4,400 units. I'm not saying I'm for or against in the future of doing anything, but this is a joke. The stuff that I'm seeing come down the pipe right now, pointing fingers at us, the stuff that's going on with ABAG, everything that's going on around us, this is not realistic. It's totally not realistic. I just want to point out something that was in the news earlier today that I kind of found uh, pretty interesting about San Francisco's management of their own issues. Wealthy San Francisco neighbors sue couple who bought their street. Hello? Hello? Did you guys read that? $14 per year per person to pay for the upkeep of the street, but the city wasn't smart enough to send the bill to the right address. And they now want to turn around and point their fingers at us and say, oh, Brisbane, you need to solve all of these problems. I think we need to be part of the solution, absolutely. I am so mad right now to be reading these things and to hear people sit here and point fingers at our city council at the people of Brisbane and say you need to solve this problem. We did not create the problem. We did not build those big towers in San Francisco and those luxury condos that are now displacing the people who are sitting here right now demanding housing and I wish I could provide it for them but I think the argument is very flawed. Sorry I'm a little upset about this. Thanks. I'm done. Thank you. Michael Chen. Good evening, on Honorable Mayor. May, uh. Good evening, Honorable Mayor. Uh. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Take your time. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Michael Chen. I'm a resident of San Francisco. I'm going to try a different tack here, uh, and I feel that the many arguments here are talking about 
change versus no change, of whether Brisbane should remain the same or should try something different. Um, I would like to propose that Brisbane will change no matter what. Uh, we live in a Bay Area that is very attractive, uh, very valuable for just, not just for the jobs, but also for uh, the Bay Area's natural beauty. Uh, we are facing great population growth and not enough homes for the people who want to live here. So I propose two possible futures uh, where Brisbane builds the Baylands, uh, one with no housing and one with housing. The one with no housing, I, I say, um, will mean that housing costs will be higher for Brisbane residents. It means that more people will be priced out. It means that children of residents here cannot afford to live close to their family members here. Um, it means that the next generation will be well, less well off than before. Uh, it means that teachers, police officers, social workers, firefighters cannot, can less, can less afford to live in Brisbane. It means a less, a more closed, less open, a more exclusive city um, where that denies opportunity to people. In the alternative with housing, I claim uh, more people will be able to stay in their homes. Extended families can live closer to each other. More, dense, more people in the city means more pet shops, uh, more Burmese restaurants, more boutique furniture stores uh, that people can frequent, more great experiences on a main street. Um, it means a uh, city, Brisbane, can be a model for great transit-oriented development uh, that is forward-thinking, that leads the Bay Area on to a better and more equi equitable future. I think the City Council and many residents here um, treat the prospect of more housing, more residents, uh, with a lot of fear. And I would like to ask the Council to treat it also with a lot of hope. Uh, hope for more opportunity for people, uh, hope for hope for a better future where we can reduce emissions because people can live closer to their jobs. Um, I recognize that Brisbane cannot solve this, pro this housing crisis by itself. Uh, Brisbane did not cause it. Uh, it is a collective action problem. Um, but I'm asking that we must fight for more housing, city by city, house by house, project by project, building by building. Um, it is a reason why I, I advocate in my neighborhood in San Francisco, uh, in the cities where I work, uh, in the, on the peninsula in Palo Alto, and why I'm here in Brisbane uh, to ask for more housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul Buscal. Thank you, Mayor and Council, and everybody here tonight. Um, well, Clara covered a lot of what I was going to say. Um, I was going to speak on the issue with the water, um, which is a big deal in itself. Um, the cleanup, you know, we don't know what the toxics are. I mean, we do know what some are, but not what all of them are. So there is concern. Um, you know, Brisbane was incorporated in 1961 because of the uh, threat of being developed by Daly City on a large magnitude. And our founding fathers back then, you know, rallied the troops and um, we, we incorporated and became a city for that reason. So <clears throat> I don't want to speak on the people that have been coming, the advocates for housing. But, you know, I just learned a new term tonight was uh, mansplaining by one of the advocates. And I believe that uh, is Yimby, uh, you're in my backyard. That's Yimby. That was a joke. Uh, so, you know, th this, 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 is, this is really um, a Brisbane issue. And, you know, um, Back when most of us, I'm sure, bought homes in Brisbane, we were middle class people and we could afford to buy a house. Um, myself and my wife couldn't afford to buy a house today in Brisbane. So I don't see how any housing in the Baylands is going to afford the opportunity for middle class people to buy homes. You know, affordable housing doesn't mean that they're affordable to the middle class. So, you know, that's kind of... You know, it's, a, it's an issue that really needs to be looked at. And I'm glad Tony Verios brought it up tonight. 
Um, you know, we've all spent a lot of time on this Baylands issue. Um, the EIR is not, it's inadequate for multiple reasons. And so, you know, we're, we're concerned community and, you know, we have talked about addressing the issues for teachers and um, municipal workers, police, firefighters, and others that come into this community to give them affordable housing. You know, the Parkside plan, they talked about um, industrial, doing mixed use. We have other issues out at uh, Sierra Point uh, where there could be um, condos put in. So, you know, we, you guys have come up with plans to meet our arena numbers. So it's not like Brisbane's not doing anything to address the housing issue. Um, you know, there's no guarantees that certain portions of that Baylands is going to be developed if there's housing approved. There's no guarantee that the interchange into 101 is going to be built. You know, we have old infrastructure here. You know, we can't support the masses that are about to descend on Brisbane. You know, they're talking about moving the Cow Palace. You know, I talked years ago about having an entertainment center in the Baylands and doing a land swap for the Cow Palace out in the, in the Baylands so the Baylands could do uh, development that Daly City wants to do on the Cow Palace property on a grand scale. You know, so there's other projects right here in our county that are going to be um, coming down the pipe. So, you know, we want to do a regional, uh, have a regional impact. And one of the biggest things that we could do as a community, as a region, and as the owners of the land is to allow Recology to expand. Because Recology has to truck all their stuff, dozens of truck trips a day to Fairfield. And South City Scavenger, who doesn't have the capacity because they can't expand on their property to do exactly what they want to do at Recology, they have to truck their stuff to Santa Rosa or Gilroy. So when we're talking about having an impact on our uh, carbon footprint, I think that would have the, the most beneficial impact. So I suggest that we go with the Planning Commission's recommendations, which were very well thought out by a lot of us in this community, including yourselves, that have an understanding of what's been brought to date. You know, a lot of people that are on the outside looking in don't understand the totality of what we're faced with in the Baylands. So I appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Parker. This is make us feel good. <laughs> this says no homes, no shop, boycott Brisbane. I, I feel rather insulted. Um, you know, we worked very hard here to keep Brisbane, Brisbane. Uh, we like to have a little town here. You know, we call it, uh, we are a city, but we are a little town. We're unique. There's no other place like Brisbane until we get far away from here. I mean, this is it. And I think we should continue to keep the character of Brisbane. Where else are we going to find something like this? You know, Woodacre in Marin County, um, Princeton, Half Moon Bay. You know, where where is another Brisbane? And you know, to our credit, people have fought hard to keep Brisbane Brisbane. And what are we going to do with the Baylands? I think the most important thing, as Paul said, is to expand recology. You know, if we expand recology, then we will be covering up the dump site. Uh, we, we will be helping Little Hollywood. They will not have the kind of pollution they're having now. Um, and, and it will just increase the quality of life for San Francisco and the region. You know, it, it, it's, that's important. I think, too, if we're going to have high-speed rail come in, yeah, okay. You know, high-speed rail, we, could ha we have an opportunity to actually cap a dump site that's unregulated. They could come in, put a hardscape on it. And so if there's liquefaction or anything else that's going on, we could keep the bay cleaner 
So yeah, we could work with them. We could we could work with them and ask them to help us cap the rest of the bay lands. I mean, the rest of the dump site. And the, and and use it at, for entertainment. If you look at all the other unregulated dump sites, these are the dump sites from the turn of the century, 19th century, 20th century, to um, you know the 70s, early 70s, when they finally just stopped having cars come up and just dump whatever they want into the dump site, and they started regulating the dump sites. We don't know what's in them. There's no way to actually find out what's in these dump sites. The only thing we can actually do is to cap it. And we can't really, if you look at all the dump sites in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, none of them have been developed at all. They're all just, the only one that's ever been cleaned up is Mare Island. And what do they do when they cleaned it up? They put a fence around it. They put a fence around it because it was very contaminated with very, very bad toxins. You know, they, and now they have a little walking path in there. So that land, as far as I'm concerned, could never be sold, ever. I think what we need to do is kind of look at the the picture besides just the housing. You know, what is actually good for this particular land? And, you know, how long has UPC had this land? They've, they've, built, they've built some wells. They checked the toxins. You know, not to the sufficient degree that I, as a member of the BBC uh, AGs, I, I never felt it was sufficient. You know, but they have never cleaned it up. And so now what they're saying is let's build 4,460 homes on it, even though they knew when they bought it that they were going to build on Schlagelock area, and we had it in our general plan not to build housing. I agree with that plan. I still don't think we should build on area that is just contaminated. I, I, I don't think it's right for Brisbane. I don't think it's right for the whole community. I live in a condominium that has been built since in the last, it's 18 years old now. And we've had to completely rebuild it. It wasn't built well enough. Uh, and, and it's very expensive. The upkeep is terrible because, you know, it was built on fill. You know, part of it was a hill and part of it was filled up. So the parts that are, are um, settled, you know, they pile-drived it and, and made it solid. But the pipes are exploding. They're actually bending and breaking constantly. And it, the upkeep is terrible. So if we're going to do that and call it low-cost housing, who's going to pay for the upkeep? You know, the people who are going to buy in it? The way that the law is now, that the people who buy into the land as it's low cost housing, they have no opportunity, none whatsoever, to build equity. And when they buy, they're still going to be part of the condo association and they're going to have to pay for whatever upkeep there is. So they have low cost, you know, they don't have much money, but yet they're going to build, buy into condos and those condos are going to need constant upkeep. There's no doubt about it, because it's going to be built on fill, and it's going to be high rises, and it's just going to need lots of attention. So I don't think this is the right place to put our low-cost citizens. I think the, a better place would be right downtown, and we should be realistic about it. You know, there's, there's other places maybe that we could put low-cost housing. Let's not put it in the Baylands. Let's, let's do something that works for the Baylands. Let's put, you know, let's, let's look at it as a transportation hub, a place to put transportation vehicles. I think this is a better solution. 
I, I, I do want us to, and I'm sure my time's up, but I want to think about the whole picture of the whole Baylands. And I actually stand by the work that we did at the Planning Commission. I think we really studied and read through thousands and thousands of pages of documents. We all did separate projects to try to understand what's going on. And I think we did a good job. So thank you. Thank you. Corey Smith. I'll do. And Corey Smith, I am speaking on behalf of myself tonight because you already heard from a couple of my colleagues. Um, you know, one of the things I always really kind of struggle with when I talk to people is you kind of have two different ways to go about it. You can either address things that people are talking about or come up and talk about the things that drove me here today and, and why I wanted to do this. So just, I had to address a couple because I was somewhat pulling my hair out. Um, number one, 75% uh, of the proposed homes are going to go within a quarter mile of the Bayshore Caltrain station. That's over two miles from here. Um, Senator Scott Weiner posted something on his Facebook and somebody had commented about redeveloping Brisbane and he perhaps more poetically than I ever could pointed out that we're not talking about touching anything in downtown Brisbane at all. We're, we're talking about the Baylands which is a couple of miles away and I really really do think that's an important distinction because the small town feel is really cool. And, and throwing 4,000 homes in your downtown urban core would change things dramatically, but I would argue it's a little less dramatic considering the distance that it is away. It is quite literally closer to San Francisco than downtown Brisbane. And I don't care who develops the land. The annexation conversation blew up really quickly. The county of San Mateo has talked about doing things. Donald Duck could build here. I, I would not care. It it's about homes and it's about creating shelter for people. That is the point. And so however that works out, uh, I just hope that there's a solution that gets everybody on the same page. Which ties to another thing. Nobody is accusing Brisbane of being the bad guy in this situation. The main reason, if we were to point to one specific thing, I would probably go with Prop 13, passed by the voters in the late 70s, that set up an inequitable tax structure that incentivizes cities around the state of California to build office and commercial instead of housing. That is the probably one single thing that led us to this issue more than anybody else, and it happened 10 years before I was born. And looking around at the other people that, yeah, I came here with from San Francisco today, most of us weren't around at that point. So the solution doesn't exist in just Brisbane either. And we know that. We are the people that are going to the community meetings in San Francisco trying to get them to upzone massive swaths of the city. Again, one of the reasons that we are in this mess is because we decided to push everything down and to limit the number of people that can move here and live here and look at where it got us. This isn't a shock. It totally makes sense. Any reasonable person with a basic understanding of supply and demand can see it and go, yeah, it does. Uh, but let's figure it out and let's try to do something going forward where the city of Brisbane can be happy and is a good regional partner so we don't have to go through the drag down knock it out fight all the time. Okay, that was in reaction to everybody else. Um, the reason that I did want to come up here and talk though is really on the environmental issues and it got brought up earlier that 37% of the state's CO2 emissions came from transportation. I, I've been spending way too much time in white papers on this stuff lately. Of that 37%, 90% of it comes from on-road transportation, so it excludes like air and airplanes, right? Or uh, rail and airplanes, rather. And then of that 90%, 37% come from individual car use. So if you take the state CO2 emissions, 37% of that is a certain percentage. 90% of that 37 and then 79 of that 90 leads you to 26.5% of the state's total CO2 emissions come from cars. A London-based environmental organization called Bioregional found that the most environmentally friendly thing to do on the Baylands would be building 10,000 units, more than double what is being proposed. If we're talking from an environmental perspective, that is the most environmentally friendly thing to do. And there's different opinions and there's different stakeholders, that's fine, but we can't ignore those facts. Cars not only are killing our planet, they're slowly killing our people. I ran across a stat today. The American Lung Association estimates that the state of California spends $15 billion every single year in health treatment related to CO2 emissions from cars. $15 billion a year because we don't build jobs, housing, and transit next to each other. That is insane. Do you know how much we can do with that money? 
there's a lot at stake here, and I get that, and I, and I am certainly aware of the position at your end in trying to get all of these conflicting opinions and voices, and yeah, oftentimes screams and harassment that are coming at you from friendly folks and not so friendly folks, it, it's chaotic, but at its core, th this really, really is an environmental issue, and if you claim to be pro-environment, you have to be pro-housing. There's no question about that. Pro-environment and pro-housing, and pro-housing next to jobs and transit, which is exactly what the Baylands is, is the way to go forward. And if you claim to be pro-environment, but you don't support housing, quite frankly, you are full of shit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, earlier I called Daniel Rosiski. Is he here? All right. There, so I have no more slips. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Please come up. Robert Howard, 18-year Brisbane resident. Um, the Brisbane Baylands is a very difficult site, and there's all sorts of interesting problems out there. Uh, it's been, part of it's been a dump for at least 100 years, started off, in fact the rail yard side started off as a dump for uh, materials removed from San Francisco starting around the time of the Great Earthquake. And then we ended up with the unregulated dump on the east side. And there's also some materials in there that we don't know about because no records were kept. Um, there's been various surveys done on that area. Um, it's my uh, from what I've been able to find out, is that on the east side it's 100 feet, uh, sorry, 200 feet down through the bay mud to um, bedrock. It's constantly wet under there. It's also got a tidal flow. So the water level goes up and down, which has a very interesting effect. Uh, s several years back, uh, Ronald Warren Land of the USGS gave a very interesting talk about uh, an arc bacteria that lives out there. And it metabolism is based on arsenic. And its behavior changes depending on how wet it is out there. And so through the day, it cycles and its metabolism changes and part of the day is outputting uh, a, ga a gaseous salt of arsenic. Uh, there's not much you can do about it because it pulls it out, the arsenic out of the water. So that's one of the problems out there. Uh, there's also all sorts of other toxins there, inorganic and organic toxins out there. Some are not known, we don't know what their interactions are. I would w not want children living out there let alone adults, because of this. Talking about CO2 problems, you're gonna have a lot of expenses from CO2 problems, you're gonna have a lot of expenses from illnesses caused by that. Uh, from what have, has been proposed so far in the, when I looked in the EIR, was that the area was not gonna be fully remediated, it was gonna be capped. So the problem is, caps get, per, get pierced over time. Uh, down on Mountain View, uh, there was a problem with one of the Google buildings that was built on, a, on top of a waste dump there, where it got inundated with the toxins off the waste dump and they had to evacuate the building after people got sick. Um, there's also been talk about Caltrain moving, once it gets, elect gets further along its electrification program, wanting to move out of San the rail yard out of San Francisco and possibly into the Brisbane Baylands. Uh, and as part of their plan for speeding up the throughput of trains, which would actually help reduce CO2 consumption because it would give people more ability to take public transport up and down the peninsula. Uh, for the housing activists, they should be going to places like Atherton, Mountain View, Menlo Park, Palo Alto, etc., down the peninsula, where they either don't allow housing, but allow a lot of office spaces to be built, more and more and more. 
um, the alternative plan that was proposed by the um, Planning Commission seems to alleviate a lot of the problems with transportation uh, miles. By, because if you build housing, people don't necessarily want to work and live where they are. They keep talking about housing for people who are working somewhere else. So that's not going to reduce your transportation miles. Also, uh, I had heard there was also had been in the past a, mem a memorandum of understanding with San Francisco that housing was going to be built across the border from Bris in Brisbane and San Francisco, and that businesses were going to be supplied on the uh, Brisbane side. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I heard. The other big problem down there is the tank farm. Tank farm is not going to go away anytime soon, if ever. Uh, there's constant plumes coming off of that, both in the air and the ground, and that blows over the baylands. Uh, let's see. Also, what about the water allocation? Uh, there was a representative of one of the water districts saying that there wasn't, at one of the meetings sometime back, saying there wasn't any allocation of water available. Uh, recently it's come to light that in California the groundwater storage situation is worse than people thought. So it turns out California had been giving permission to dump uh, oil well wastewater in the incorrect, in the wrong aquifers. So they were being dumped in sweet water aquifers and contaminating the groundwater. And that's it. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak who hasn't spoken? No? Thank you all for your public comment. Appreciate everyone's patience and input. Is there anything else from the council on this matter before we move on? Okay. So we'll move on to Mayor Council Matters, item A, City Council schedule concerning the Baylands deliberations. We're not voting tonight. I think we're going to talk about that right now. That's the next item on the calendar, on the, on the agenda. So would staff like to speak to that? Yeah, as we stated earlier in the evening, we'll get back to you as soon as we have more information from um, our lobbyists in Sacramento in terms of what's happening, um, in terms of both timing and substance. And um, we'll report back as soon as we have information to report back. So the calendar that has the, the dates of August 17th and 31st, so those then will come off the calendar or will they stay on? Um, I would just um, maybe leave them in your personal placeholder, but not. Uh, we won't be scheduling those at this time, particularly the 17th because the legislature doesn't go back into the session until the 21st. So I think it's safe to say the 17th would not be a night, although you do have a closed session item that, that on another item that night, just as a reminder. Okay. Um, but the 31st, um, I think we'll just kind of put it on hold for right now. And when was when does the legislative session end? Um, I don't know, sometime in September. September, yeah. okay. So, sorry, do you want to come up to the microphone? Yeah. If you want to ask a question? Yeah, I'm just... Um, so I would agree there's a lot of statewide housing legislation that's up right now, but I'm not sure any of it actually has much relevancy to the Baylands. And so I'm curious, what is the argument of which of the housing bills that are making the, there's about 130, I know most of them. What are the ones that you're saying have any relevancy to the Baylands? Yeah, if I may, through the council, I don't think we should really be talking about this. Yeah, I'll leave it. No. I think our city attorney. But if you have no justification for this delay, then um, we can delay something well, for any reason. I the council member asked you to come up and ask a question, but we're, we're done with, with, with the public process right now in regards to coming to the podium, and so... But it seems like you're just extending the public process for more and more and more in order to continue to delay and delay and delay a decision. This, this seems like another effort to not make a decision here tonight. Okay, thank you for your opinion. City Attorney? 
I think uh, the mayor indicated at the start of the meeting that the council was going to uh, uh, take this, uh, not take any action tonight and wait for the legislative process to uh, continue. And once the staff has information from our lobbyists about uh, what that legislation looks like and analyze it, then we will bring back to the council and, um, and schedule further deliberations. Okay. Okay, so moving on to next item is written communications. I'd like to acknowledge receipt of written communications regarding the Brisbane Baylands project. Between July 24th and August 7th, we received written correspondence from the following people. Adrian Roy, Ryan Jones, Manuel Apollonio, Garrett Coetzee, Bradley Dunn, David Hildebrand, Brian Davis, Lawrence Chung, Isabella Chu, Martha Ektal, Sarah Brano, Yvonne Lee Healy, Ewan Ko, Tay Feeder, Evan Kogener, Barbara Newhauser, Brent Kamrath, Nelson Borja, Shannon Hamilton, Jason, Jason Shire, Shire, Cliff Moon, Rob Hornick, Eric Annenson, Nathan Howard, Jason Cummings, Peter Collagen, Kevin Riggle, Gregory Lemieux, Michael Ducker, Dan Fingal Surma, Watson Ladd, and Sarah Bland. And with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.